today I will be dealing with another interesting uh, topic on spectroscopy and uh, this is uh, one of the spectroscopic tool widely used um, in many research labs. Uh, however, uh, considering our own um, limitations for getting such a sophisticated uh, spectroscopic tool, um, in our country we have not really majored on this spectroscopy and therefore, I would like to singly uh, emphasize more about the usefulness of this spectroscopic tool which has come into um, the uh, study of materials in a bigger way. Uh, this is popularly called as uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy and uh, this is also complementary to whatever information that we are getting from X-ray photo electron spectroscopy which we have seen in the previous lecture where we have highlighted that XPS spectroscopy is uh, or XPS spectra is a very good surface analysis tool where up to 10 nanometer thick uh, surfaces uh, can be studied in greater detail uh, talks about the impurities that can happen in the surface and then how we can uh, probe the different metal ions that are present and also on uh, the characteristic X-ray that is coming out. Therefore, uh, XPS is a very good analytical tool, but today what we are going to see is a absorption phenomena which has been used very uh, nicely to explore unusual oxidation states. So, in this uh, lecture I will give you some principles about how X-ray absorption spectroscopy can be understood and then little bit on the instrumentation and I will take one particular uh, group of oxide and do a thorough study on how we can use excess uh, information for analyzing uh, a particular perovskite compound. As you would see the incident rays uh, that are falling on a sample actually is undergoing a uh, lot of change. One is you can get scattered x-rays from the uh, sample or we can get fluorescent uh, x-rays which are used for x-ray fluorescent spectroscopy or we can get photoelectrons. The light can also be uh, transmitted, but not in the same magnitude of that of the incident ray and therefore, we can try to map the intensity ratio as a function of uh, mu x and x is your thickness and mu is your absorption coefficient. So, if your sample is um, sufficiently thin, it is possible even to map the transmitted x-rays and the phenomena that is happening when x-rays are uh, absorbed by the sample. It can either come out as a photoelectron or as a Auger electron and uh, then a fluorescent photon. So, from the way we harvest the uh, secondary processes that happen due to uh, the interaction between the material and the incident x-rays, we can categorize different sort of spectroscopies. <coughs> In the last lecture, I showed the same view graph where I characterized two important techniques. One is based on electron spectroscopies and one based on ion spectroscopies. Especially, I talked to you about uh, Auger electron and discussed to you in detail about X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, gave you some idea about RBS which is specially used to look at epitaxial layers and how the uh, thin films are growing as single, cr uh, single crystals. Also I told what this X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy is, basically this is reflecting a photoelectric effect and this simple photoelectric effect can be uh, transformed or exploited to analyze and quantify several chemical reactions and there we looked at what this photoelectric process is, the ejected photoelectron is what we are trying to map and in the process you also have the Auger electron that is coming out uh, from here. Now to draw a parallel between XS and XPS, I just want to make uh, some comments. One is core holes are created anyway when uh, when there is when a core electron is actually knocked out and therefore, uh, by ionization it can happen and that forms the basis for 
X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. Core holes are created by ionization um, by the incident X-rays and therefore, those are called as X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy and core holes are formed by excitation of electron which forms the basis for the X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So, in both cases XPS and XS we can say that the final states are highly unstable when the core hole decays by non radiant process one is either a Oger relaxation which ends up in a Oger electron spectroscopy or by radiant X-ray emission process which is called as X-ray emission spectroscopy. So, this X-ray emission spectroscopy is actually a secondary phenomena that goes along with XS, whereas uh, AES is a secondary phenomena that happens because of XPS. So, in some sense both have a parallel. So, uh, when we talk about XS, we also take into consideration um, X-ray emission that is coming out. To make things si look simpler, how do we get this absorption spectra? We can say that there is a beam of different wavelength, uh, you can use any sort of a wavelength and uh, this beam source is actually incident on the radiation and uh, now the electron is actually uh, 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 absorbs energy and it can go to any of the bound states or to any of the states near to the continuum uh, that is the vacuum level or it can go into the vacuum level and depending on that then we, we can try to populate uh, those regions selectively and then the transmitted radiation can be mapped and this is what comes out as a absorption spectra which we can uh, try to analyze. Now, uh, there are two things that we need to have in mind. One thing is when in X-ray absorption spectroscopy, if we have a core electron which is excited into unoccupied atomic or molecular orbitals above the Fermi level, uh, then uh, XS can be divided into two regimes. One we can call this as X-ray absorption fine structure or we can call this as extended X-ray absorption fine structure when the outgoing electron is well above the ionization continuum. But if it is somewhere in the bound states, for example, we talk about a 2 p going to 3 d level or 2 p to 4 d level, uh, then we talk about bound states and low energy resonances in the continuum. So, uh, either of this can happen as you see from this view graph, uh, electron is knocked out and it is actually going above the Fermi level, but it is not actually going into the continuum. So, this is one of the bound states and uh, depending on that, the you will get a typical characteristic feature of X-ray which will tell uh, what sort of excitations are possible. In this case, you can see uh, nitrogen is absorbed on nickel 100 and when it is glued uh, or to the surface, when it is adsorbed to the surface, then you get a clear um, reflection for a uh, 2 pi uh, interaction and uh, this is a typical uh, excess uh, peak that you would get uh, for nitrogen uh, 1s to 2 pi transition, 2 pi star transition. We will come to this issue in, in example. So, just to map what are all the uh, different uh, uh, studies that we can do in excess, we can actually talk about a pre edge which is uh, which can be characterized here as uh, X ray absorption near edge structures uh, X A N E S and uh, this is what is the region where you can actually map the uh, information that you are getting. In fact, you would get several uh, features around this edge. So, this is what you call it as uh, X-ray absorption near edge structure and uh, this is the region where you actually play around for X-ray absorption spectroscopy. I will tell you what sort of peaks that you can get out of this and um, this is the region where you have the uh, transitions happening between 1s to n plus 1 p level or it could be p to um, n plus 1 d level. 
So, th this region actually takes care of such bound states and uh, this is the region where you can uh, talk about the pre H and if you are talking about uh, 1 S electron knocked out, out of the continuum of, or if the knocked out electron is well within the continuum, then you talk about the extended X-ray absorption fine structure. So, several of these processes happen all these are mapped under the same phenomena of X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So, we will uh, specially look it is not possible in one single lecture to cover the whole spectrum of uh, manifestation of this spectroscopy. So, I would like to take some uh, interest to talk about uh, different things that can happen in this uh, edge. Uh, that is why it is called as edge spectroscopy and this edge is actually attached to the sort of excitations that can happen. It can be called as K H or L or M. We will see that in the next slide. As I uh, told in the previous one, we are talking about different forms of spectroscopy here and uh, this is the uh, excess edge spectroscopy that we are precisely talking about and the relative scale of energy that involves each of this spectroscopy is also given. Therefore, we, uh, we can single out and say that I am exactly talking about XFs or I am talking about XANES or I am talking about XS based on the energy range that we are using for the spectroscopies. Uh, now, uh, when we talk about H, we are talking about different uh, uh, transitions uh, that can happen, absorptions that can happen. If K H is happening, then the electron from 1 s is actually excited and therefore, we call this as a K H. If it is L, then it can involve both 2 s and 2 p, but we differentiate that between L 1, L 2 and L 3. L 1 is typical for uh, 2 s electrons getting to the continuum or it could be 2 p or uh, 2 p uh, 3 by 2. So, both these are characterized by L 2 and L 3. When we actually talk about uh, bigger metal ions, this L 2 and L 3 uh, give a very rich uh, information about the oxidation states. Similarly, we can go for M 1, M 2 and M 3 uh, so on. Each one is designated by the uh, orbitals that are associated with it. So, excess data are obtained by tuning the photon energy using a crystalline monochromator to a range where core electrons can be excited and the range is typical of the order of 0 0.1 to 100 kV EV photon energy. Uh, depending on the range, then we can selectively try to knock out the particular core, core electron. So, if we talk about K, then we are talking about a very high energy uh, radiation. If we talking about a 2 p levels that is L H medium uh, range and then uh, still smaller ranges for 3 D, uh, 3 S and 3 P. Uh, so, this is how we designate this uh, K H L 1, L 2 and L 3. L 2 and L 3 we uh, try to uh, categorize based on the um, L S coupling. So, if your transition is from P to D or S to P, then your L is equal to 1. <coughs> and this one can uh, couple with either S is equal to half or S is equal to 0 and depending on that you will actually get this half or um, 3 by 2 which is nothing but your L s coupling. So, based on this you can get L 2 and L 3 always we can remember as a notation L 3 we always talk about 3 by 2 it is easy to remember that way L 2 is half. So, L 2, L 3 edges are nothing but two states from the same transition resulting out of um, the spin orbit coupling. Typically, if you look at uh, uh, X-ray map, uh, excess mapping, you can see a sharp edge for K and this is for L 1, this is for L 2 and this is for L 3 and as you would see here, L 3 always comes at higher energy compared to L 2. So, in a typical spectra uh, of excess, your uh, higher energy spectra will always be associated with L 3 
and the low energy peak will be associated with L2. And uh, there are other things that happen apart from the H uh, where you have uh, for example, this uh, platinum tetracyano complex where you see additional features that are coming and these are called the um, near edge fine structure uh, due to excess and uh, this, this peak comes from a constructive interference and this peak comes from a destructive interference. So, these fine structures can give us idea about the uh, local coordination and uh, other informations about bonding and uh, the nearest neighbor occupancy and so on. So, this is also a very useful tool that is being probed. Now, where is excess becoming more crucial and more sophisticated as I mentioned to you, uh, the way we produce x-rays are very typical. Uh, we use uh, a filament to um, get electrons which will knock at a particular target which is copper molybdenum or anything any particular metal and when it strikes a uh, characteristic x-ray comes out of it which we categorize as k alpha or k beta radiation. But in synchrotron radiation or in uh, excess we actually get a high energy uh, x-ray and not the conventional one that we generate in our uh, usual lab practices. What we do here is get the same x-ray and this x-ray is actually confined to a ring and in this ring we try to boost the speed of this electron such a way it is a accelerated electron which will um, uh, x-ray beam which will actually come out and that will collide with your material to have a very selective excitations made. So, um, what we are trying to do is generate the same x-ray as that of the lab experiments, but we are trying to accelerate in a confined uh, space. So, uh, this is your conventional x-ray machine, x-ray comes it interacts with your material and then it goes to the detector. In uh, synchrotron source, we actually try to uh, boost the speed of the electron and then the x-rays are actually x-ray beam is actually brought out with a greater force. So, one of this can selectively go and hit. So, when it is actually spinning at different points you can collect the uh, x-ray uh, x-ray beam. Therefore, um, this is called a synchrotron because in one space you can have many stations where you can try to get it uh, with the different uh, uh, centrifugal inclination. Um, at different tangents you can try to get uh, the source output and as a result we can study from one synchrotron source many experiments parallelly. So, this is uh, that way a very sophisticated uh, uh, instrumentation and uh, just to show you um, one of the major facilities is in Germany it is called DESI and uh, there is another one is called BESI in Berlin and uh, DESI is in Hamburg. Uh, as you would see here, it is more of a consortium, it is not a single man's property. Most of the uh, research institutes, foundations including government, they pitch in to sustain such a major facility. Therefore, this is not a simple um, stuff. Uh, definition of a synchrotron, we can take it from here. When high energy particles are in rapid motion, including electrons, they are forced to travel in a curved path by a magnetic field uh, which we call it as booster and then synchrotron radiation is thus produced. We will look at bird's eye view of one synchrotron facility which is there. This is your linear accelerator. I will also show a animation in the next slide. This linear accelerator actually pumps in x-ray which is actually getting boosted here with a magnetic coil and then on gaining momentum this will actually go into the outer um, sphere and then from here at different points you can actually collect this fast moving x-rays and these are the substations. These are your substations where you can bring any of your instrument. If you are only uh, interested in analyzing a particular sample you can try to do that or if you want 
a deposition chamber also to be transported you you are free to come and house your equipment here study for a particular time and then you can take it back. So, therefore, uh, this is a more of a central facility confined in a very large space and uh, many uh, laboratories can be housed together and the uh, output is actually shared by everyone at the same time. So, therefore, it is a very sophisticated uh, structure and uh, the dimension of this uh, synchrotron facility is quite huge. We will look at uh, one of the slide to understand this. Uh, we will see a short animation on uh, what this facility will look like and this is the inner side of uh, the advanced light source where you can see the inner core actually is generating x-ray from a linear accelerator which is boosted up by the booster rings and the booster rings are those which are having a uh, magnetic field and once it comes out to the periphery then it can actually go through uh, several substations where this uh, <coughs> accelerated x-rays can be used and this is how the booster actually works and once it comes out then it can be monochromatized and it can interact with the material giving uh, many informations that is needed not just uh, on the spectroscopy in fact even imaging of uh, structures can be used using this uh, map. Um, having seen uh, the sophistication that is involved in uh, this I should also um, mention to you uh, that this is a very selective uh, facility that is available across the world and uh, here is a list of all the synchrotron radiation facilities that is available. It is also called as advanced light source and uh, as you would see here uh, many countries are really competing in this field. Uh, what is important to notice is the circumference of the um, synchrotron uh, radiation source that we can look for in terms of meters and then the energy that is generated. Um, in this list you would see that uh, the major players are actually in Europe and uh, in US and most of the facilities are housed in US therefore, this is a very very costly equipment that has to be sustained um, and uh, one of the oldest as you would see here is uh, uh, from Lawrence Berkeley laboratory uh, commissioned and it was also decommissioned in 1993 subsequently a new advanced light source has come into picture and then another one has been commissioned uh, when the previous one was uh, decommissioned that is in 1993. Uh, you can actually uh, look at the sophistications involved the amount of uh, giga electron volt that it can uh, generate uh, these are some of the largest facilities in the world as of now uh, with a very very uh, massive uh, infrastructure one is in Argonne National Lab and uh, equally uh, uh, important are those in uh, Germany. Uh, but we are also in the game in, in a smaller way for example, if you look at uh, Indian situation we have two synchrotron light source both are housed in indoor and this is called Indus 1 and Indus 2, but you would see the circumference or uh, the dia of your uh, source is very very small um, uh, compared to what we saw in the earlier case they have the circumference of uh, 1000 uh, meters, but we have fairly a very small uh, unit and the capability also is very uh, less therefore, uh, we can only study organic molecules using this facility it is not possible to study heavier atoms. So, this is limited nevertheless we are also in the map uh, as far as uh, synchrotron radiations are concerned I am sure in the days to come there will be lot more progress and we will improvise on this um, facility uh, as a nation. So, uh, this just to give you some idea about uh, how these are localized and uh, there is there are also programs in our own country where we tie up with this advanced light source especially uh, our country encourages a uh, uh, lot of projects uh, which can be uh, returned to Trieste in Italy where there is a synchrotron facility. So, it is possible for those who are looking for this spectroscopy to 
make a proposal and go and do a time bound research. But what we should also understand is that if you are really looking for in situ equip, uh, experiments, then we need to take the whole equipment and attach it to the beam line to study this. Most of the reactions that are done is all in situ, it is not ex situ. So, uh, therefore, it is a very sophisticated way of looking at it. Now, let us look at the spectral features of this uh, uh, study and then understand little bit about what we can learn. In the simplest case that of a uh, cupric that is copper 2 complex, the 2 p to 3 d transition actually produces uh, a 2 p 5 3 d 10 final state. Uh, so, when an electron is actually removed from uh, 2 p 5, then what really happens uh, to that? The 2 p 5 core actually can, uh, which is created in the transition, this has a orbital angular momentum and which couples with the spin angular momentum. Therefore, it produces two states j is equal to 3 by 2 and j is equal to two st uh, half state and this actually comes out as a exact peak which we call it as L 2 and L 3 h. So, the intensities also are almost of the same order. These states are directly observable in the L h spectrum as the two main peaks. So, whenever we talk about uh, L h spectra uh, uh, using x x, we are uh, talking about L 3 and L 2 that is actually coming from a transition of p to d or s to p orbital. Uh, so, uh, as we move across the periodic table, especially from copper, you go down, uh, uh, go on the left side across the period then you will see we create additional holes in the metal 3 d orbitals. Uh, Let us take the case of uh, iron which is a low spin and in low spin it is actually uh, iron 3 is uh, uh, T 2 G 5 E G 0 and uh, therefore, this is your uh, ground state and in T 2 G 5 E G 0 uh, resulting in transitions to the T 2 G and E G D, D uh, sigma sets. Therefore, there are two possible final states that can happen when you are actually promoting a 2 p electron uh, through uh, to either of this uh, uh, 3 d orbitals. You can end up with a T 2 G 6 that is what is denoted here or we can end up with a T 2 G 5 E G 1 and depending on these two then you can actually get a a uh, peak like this and this peak actually corresponds to the electron promoted to uh, this final state and this peak corresponds to electron that is promoted to uh, this state. So, uh, since the ground state metal configuration has one hole in the T 2 g orbital set and four holes in the E g orbital set and intensity ratio of 1 is to 4 is actually expected as you would see here. between. Uh, T 2 g and E g depending on the number of holes the um, the intensity of the peak also would vary in the ratio 1 is to 4, but it it is not always true what will happen is uh, this does not D 6 excited state will further split in energy due to D D electron repulsion as a result you would see a much more uh, complicated or a split pattern of these two peaks. So, these two peaks need to be uh, analyze rather more carefully because there are other things that would compound with this uh, these structures. So, uh, if you single out just the L H uh, spectral component and try to look at it uh, especially for um, complexes with the metal center, then your Tanabe Sugano diagram will uh, help you uh, simulate theoretically how many L H uh, spectrum can originate. As you would see here, you go from lower energy to higher energy uh, region, the spectral features actually becomes more complicated. Therefore, more and more transitions are expected when you go to higher regions and that is what you see here. Other factors like P, D, uh, electron repulsion, spin orbit coupling, all this has to be uh, considered when you try to simulate all the possible LH spectral components that are there. So, for ferric system if you uh, consider there are theoretically there are 252 initial states and 1260 
possible final states are possible um, together with uh, <coughs> the final L, uh, L H spectrum. Uh, but what you would find here despite all this possible state it has been established that the low spin ferric system uh, the lowest energy peak is due to the transition to the T 2 G hole and a more intense higher energy uh, peak is that to the unoccupied E g orbitals. So, although there are several states possible selectively these two states predominate over the other contributions which can actually be mapped and you can see the see that from the L 3 H although there are split patterns then you will be able to resolve uh, which one is due to T 2 G and which one is due to E g. Uh, so, there are two things that we need to understand within L 3 uh, there will be two peak which will uh, uh, which will correspond to excitation to T 2 G or E G um, and then you also have the L 2. So, both this uh, come into picture when we look at uh, the excess um, for for a complex like this which is a hexacyano uh, ion 3 complex uh, you would see for a low spin. Uh, this first peak corresponds to uh, transition to T 2 G and this second peak actually corresponds to E G and then the third peak corresponds to the M level that is your pi star. So, this is for um, uh, this is for uh, L 3 and this is for L 2 and similarly for other uh, transition metals you can see this is a inner sphere complex and this is a outer sphere complex and uh, in both cases you would see the spectral features are actually uh, different. Uh, I will take one uh, example from our own work on uh, perovskite manganese and try to see how we have resolved uh, some of the fundamental interactions that are happening within the unit cell using X as a uh, tool. As you know uh, perovskite manganese show interesting properties both in terms of uh, magnetism and electrical conductivity and uh, this actually comes from a phenomena called double exchange where you have uh, from M n 3 the E g electron actually goes to M n 4 plus uh, E g shell which is unoccupied. As a result when this is actually um, transferring to the M n 4 plus core. Uh, and if it is ferromagnetically aligned to the localized T 2 G electrons then this will actually become a M n 3 plus because the electron has come here and in the process this M n 3 will actually become M n 4. As a result there will be a um, shift of this electron back and forth which is called as double exchange and because of this double exchange phenomena that is happening mainly because of the presence of M n 3 and M n 4 then there is a interesting change from a paramagnetic to ferromagnetic state and from a insulator to a metallic state. So, two things happen uh, when, when we try to initiate uh, this electron transfer process and this transfer of electron is uh, given as transfer integral that is T i j which is uh, proportional to cos theta i j. So, this cross theta i j is nothing but the, the angle that is made between these two ion cores. So, if this is going to be 180 then the transfer integral is going to be at its maximum. If this is actually going to be like this for example, then this will get locked up at 90 degree. So, this transfer integral has to be approximate theta has to be approximately theta i j 180 degree for a collinear ferromagnetism to operate. Now, in this situation uh, you need both the case of M n 3 and M n 4 which is called as a Zener pair M n 3 plus and M n 4 plus which is very crucial. So, I just want to emphasize that this Zener pair M n 3 M n 4 plus ratio is critical for this uh, spectacular manifestation of magnetic and electrical conducting uh, properties to occur 
at the same trans transition temperature. Now, uh, as I told you M n 3 M n 4 is more sensitive therefore, if I try to alter this M n 3 M n 4 ratio M n 4 plus ratio then this double exchange or this strange occurrence of paramagnetic to ferromagnetic transition will be disturbed or it will be killed. As a result we, we this ratio has to be maintained at all cost. What we have tried to do uh, is to put ruthenium into this uh, site either magnus 3 plus or 4 plus set and try to see whether this interaction can still be maintained and how XX can be used to ascertain the interaction between magnus and ruthenium core centers. Uh, in the next slide we will see how uh, ruthenium when it is substituted into manganese sites uh, what will happen to the ferromagnetic interaction. Uh, from this uh, cartoon in the top you would see the plot of magnetization as a function of uh, temperature and this is a typical ferromagnetic transition that is happening and during this transition if you keep on adding ruthenium as I told you M n 3 plus M n 4 plus ordering um, is very important and if little amount of M n 4 plus is also reduced then immediately it will spoil the double exchange phenomena and you can clearly see that the more ruthenium that is doped the lesser the ferromagnetic transition and the ferromagnetic transition is decreasing to lower temperature from room temperature. But what is interesting is even up to 40 percent of ruthenium that you dope into the manganese site you can still observe a very strong collinear ferromagnetism and this suggests that something else should be happening for this double exchange phenomena to occur or to sustain otherwise even 10 percent of any 3D metal if we try to dope in manganese site will actually kill this whole magnetic interaction from a paramagnetic to a anti ferromagnetic or to a insulating phase. So, uh, this is the maximum that has been uh, considered as the limiting composition for doping into manganese site either by iron, chromium or um, any other metal ions. So, what is special about this ruthenium? Why when ruthenium 4 is substituted this long range ferromagnetism is still sustained. Why I am uh, particularly emphasizing this here is when you consider a unit lattice of manganese, manganese, manganese and uh, ruthenium for example. So, ruthenium 3 plus manganese 3 plus is there, manganese 4 plus is there. If you are increasing the proportion to 40 we are saying at every alternate position next to manganese we are almost bringing an another ruthenium. So, in a basal plane A B basal plane where we have manganese ruthenium manganese ruthenium then we are almost evolving at a new perovskite phase and this is not known or reported so far. So, in this case what is that which is happening uh, special to ruthenium doping compared to all other uh, transition metals is the question and how we can use excess to uh, prove this point. As I told you from the previous graph um, this long range ferromagnetism is also exemplified in the plot of resistance versus temperature as you can see here even with 30 and 40 percent ruthenium doping. 40 percent ruthenium doping you can still this see this metal insulated transition on and in these three cases metallic behavior is still seen. So, this is quite unusual for a ruthenium doping to show such a long range ferromagnetism and not only to this 3 D perovskites or 3 D manganates if we take any two dimensional layered manganates like this in two dimensional layered manganese like LA 1.2, CA 1.8, MN 2 minus X, RUX you actually have this collinear ferromagnetism which is confined 
only in the a b axis a b axis and along the c axis it is not possible along the c axis uh, it is not uh, magnetically ordered. So, this is called as two dimensional magnets where magnetism is confined only in two dimensions, but even in this case as you see if you put ruthenium instead of killing the ferromagnetism it is only improving on the ferromagnetic transition. In other words with more and more of ruthenium concentration you are able to push the T c even to 20 Kelvin which is a very unusual state. So, something very unusual is happening when ruthenium is doped into manganese and uh, you can see that the same case happens when you change from strontium to calcium again increase in magnetization and uh, therefore, there is some uh, thing that we can draw there is a clear s double exchange which is dominating over super exchange in the up to 20 percent of ruthenium doping beyond which there seems to be some competing magnetic interactions which I will discuss in some other module about the uh, different magnetic phase. I will quickly go through another example of uh, a simple uh, manganate uh, L A 0.7 calcium 0.3 manganese 1. X uh, ruthenium X. In this case even if you keep on changing ruthenium you can look at the L 2 L 3 H and see how the nature of this x-ray absorption peak changes. For example, you we can actually try to compare the L 2 L 3 H with respect to ruthen, uh, strontium ruthenate S R R U O 3 because S R R U O 3 in this case the valency of ruthenium is proven. So, if you make a comparison with that and you can clearly see that in the case of the uh, <coughs> ruthenium L 2 L 3 H we can clearly see that there is a shift for above point ruthenium 0.2 uh, in, in this compositions. So, therefore, the, uh, the ruthenium valency seems to be varying somewhere from 4 plus to some other valency which is actually contributing to stabilizing the ferromagnetic interaction. And uh, as you see here the uh, solid lines represent L 3 and the open circles represent L 2 and L 2 is actually shifted L 2 is supposed to come here uh, in the lower energies L 2 is supposed to come somewhere here, but it is purposely pushed here. So, that there is a comparison between L 2 and L 3 edges are made. So, what we see from this curve is that there is some issue that is uh, significantly happening with the ruthenium oxidation state. Now, let us take another example of S R R U O 3 as I told you in S R R U O 3 which is the parent compound ruthenium is in 4 plus. Therefore, instead of doping ruthenium into manganate we can now do a reverse doping where we put manganese into a known ruthenium uh, oxide. So, in that case also you would see this is a ferromagnetic metal whereas, S R M N O 3 is a anti ferromagnetic insulator. Now, if you keep on doping manganese into ruthenium you would see that there is a very uh, strong ferromagnetic signal there even up to 70 percent we can see a ferromagnetic transition that is happening there is a sustained T c this is very very unusual. So, there is something happening not only in ruthenium there is something happening in manganese also. So, what is that which is stabilizing ferromagnetism between ruthenium and manganese centers this is what we can probe and uh, I am just listing out some of the uh, um, uh, parameters from the magnetic study uh, T c as uh, as you can see because it is a broad transition we can try to derivatize the curve and take the T c uh, even up to 50 percent of manganese doping we still see a very clear um, Curie temperature that is ferromagnetic ordering and uh, although the T c is dropping nevertheless it is not becoming non magnetic. Now, uh, to probe this let us take the case of manganese 
L23 spectra and uh, if we look at the L2H and the L3H, L3H seems to be going through a very different feature compared to L2 and therefore, if we carefully probe this as you increase the concentration of uh, manganese in strontium ruthenate, this particular C uh, peak is actually growing in strength than B. So, we, we can say that as we increase the uh, uh, concentration of manganese, then something is happening to the oxidation state of manganese. It may be either 3 or it should be 4 and that is why this particular uh, intensity has grown very significantly compared to position B. And now, uh, let us take the same L23H uh, for manganese core and try to compare this equiatomic composition that is 50-50 of ruthenium and manganese and make comparison between MnO2 and LiMn2O4, you can clearly see that uh, this 50-50 composition is resembling more of LiMn2O4 compared to MnO2 because in MnO2 you actually have Mn only in 3 plus state whereas, LiMn2O4 is a solid state battery material it is a electrolyte uh, sorry it is a electrode and in this case manganese is present both in 3 and 4 state. So, what we can say at this stage is when manganese is doped into uh, uh, ruthenium or ruthenates, manganese is undergoing a mixed valence state similar to what we see saw in ruthenium substituted manganates. Now, let us go one, one more step and try to map the ruthenium L23 spectra carefully uh, for all the sub substitutions uh, as a function of x. As you see here, this uh, x is equal to 0 is SR RuO3 and once you go up to 0.5, you can clearly see that there is a shift in the H for both L2 and L3 and also this L3 peak intensity is growing in intensity. So, that clearly says that there is a shift in the uh, ruthenium valence. Uh, so, instead of 4 plus ruthenium, there seems to be a shift to higher valence state because the shift is more towards higher energy. Therefore, it should be ruthenium 4 to either ruthenium 5 or ruthenium 6. This much we can analyze from there. So, let us take a comparison now. We will compare it with SR RuO3 which is 4 plus state and here is another well known SR4 RuO2O9 which actually shows ruthenium in 5 plus state. Now, if you compare the SR RuMn um, signal, it is neither in SR RuO3 state which is 4 plus nor in SR4 RuO2O9 state which is 5 plus. So, we can say clearly that the position of the 50-50 composition clearly suggests that ruthenium is in both 4 plus and 5 plus state. So, because of that we seem to be seeing a unusual ferromagnetic interaction. Now, this can actually be compared to another well known well characterized uh, system which is LASR copper ruthenate structure which is a uh, recently found ferromagnetic compound and this particular one has ruthenium in both um, 4 plus 5 plus ratio and as a result we can say that it is ruthenium which is undergoing a transformation to 5 plus uh, state. Now, to exclude the possibility of uh, the crystal field contributions that can come uh, other than uh, or due to manganese doping we can actually try to do a theoretical uh, calculation also, where we can try to map the L2, L3H of both 4D4 and 4D3 uh, states, 4D4 and 4D3 uh, uh, states. Uh, in this case, we can try to change the slatter angle, uh, which is nothing but your 10 dq value and see how the L uh, L2 and L3 edges behave and this is the case for um, 4D4, this is the case for 4D3 plus, 
43 plus incidentally is your ruthenium 4 and uh, 43 plus and in this case this is 44 plus which is your ruthenium 5 plus. As you would see very clearly not much change is happening because only in this case you see the intensity of this A peak growing but nevertheless you do not see any new features coming because this is corresponding only to 0 0.2 um, electron volt. So, 0 0.2 electron volt cannot uh, substantiate for a, uh, a, a promotion of 4 plus to a 5 plus state. So, all we can say is the contribution is actually coming not from crystal field, but it is coming purely from the oxidation state. And for this calculation, we have actually used uh, um, a Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian actually talks about the H average which is uh, which is coming from uh, the crystal field and then this is uh, the one which is uh, uh, the Hamiltonian due to multiple splitting and this Hamiltonian MS is um, coming both from the LS coupling of your 2p electron, LS coupling of your 4d electron and then your cubic crystal field contribution and also this is from uh, the uh, exchange integral and the Coulomb integral of your uh, of your electrons uh, that is from 2p to uh, 4d. So, uh, this contribution is actually coming from your Coulomb and exchange integral and this exchange integral g i j is what we call it as Slater integral. So, all we can say from this calculation is that that uh, the uh, crystal field is not contributing to this splitting, but this is truly coming from uh, the oxidation state. Uh, having said that, uh, what we can say, what are the consequence of the presence of uh, ruthenium 5 plus in the state and how does it influence on the ferromagnetic state. So, this is a, a sum up contour just to understand um, having understood that there is a mixed valence state uh, in manganese and having understood that there is a mixed valency in ruthenium, how can we make a case for this? Uh, as you would see from a typical perovskite um, of manganate, the A axis and the B axis can be represented like this and in this we told that this E g electron can go to this site if it is ferromagnetically ordered when this angle is 180 degree. Now, when we try to substitute ruthenium uh, into this place, what is happening? Ruthenium 4 plus gets oxidized to ruthenium 5 plus and in the bargain part of your manganese 4 plus is actually getting reduced to manganese 3 plus. As a result, now if you carefully look at the T 2 G E G level of ruthenium 5 plus and T 2 G E G level of your manganese 4 plus, the Parent hey, parentage of the T 2 G E G orbital is the same. In other words, we are almost providing two pathways for this itinerant E G electron to hop. One it can go from here to manganese 4 plus or it can go from here to ruthenium 5 plus because as far as the T 2 G E G occupation it remains the same for both. As a result, even if you are going to substitute ruthenium to the order of 50 percent, you still can see a ferromagnetic ordering because of the isoelectronic configuration. Not only that, the coupled manganese 3, 4 has a size which is comparable to that of manganese 4, 5 and also both have uh, a comparable uh, redox potential. Um, in this case, redox potential for this is 1.01 and in this case it is 1.13 um, EV. Therefore, because of the uh, matching redox potential, whenever you try to put ruthenium 4 plus into manganese, immediately it promotes to ruthenium 5 plus. So, even though ruthenium 4 plus is getting reduced to manganese 3 plus, you are almost creating another site for this electron ho hopping to occur. As a result, a ferromagnetism can be substantiated. So, this is a this is one case that uh, we uh, I have tried to explain to you where excess can uh, without any uh, doubt can resolve this issue because it gives you precise information about 
the local structure, the oxidation state. As a result, we can propose a mechanism which is very unique of this particular compound. So, with this, I would like to um, finish, and uh, there is a small animation that we can try to look at and uh, how the uh, instrumentation uh, is housed and uh, what are all the facilities that we can see. Here is where the yellow line uh, signifies that the um, uh, high energy x-rays are uh, diverted to many places and we can also typically see how this can be used in different substations. And these are the uh, many uh, beam lines that we see in this advent light source. A typical substation actually will have a lab as the lab that we see here. And not only we can look at the spectroscopy as you would see in this particular lab which is using ALS source, we actually have um, a scanning tunneling microscopy which is being uh, conducted and uh, this is specially on an isolated carbon nanotube and uh, here is uh, a person working on carbon nanotubes and the images are being seen here. 